fake non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And I thought, let me get my little thing here. Um, I thought we'd start by talking about pain. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of pain. There's acute or chronic, and acute is you know what you feel when you have an injury or have a surgery, and it's temporary and it's, uh, it gets better as you heal. Um, uh, and it can be either uh, acute or chronic, and then chronic is more of your things like uh, low back pain that goes on and on, or your osteoarthritis, things that um, are the result of chronic injury uh, when you're bone on bone um, in your joints, or um, that kind of pain that doesn't go away, that you have to constantly deal with on a daily basis, which I totally get having had two back surgeries. So for those of you that struggle with pain on a daily basis, um, it is difficult. It does, it does change your life. And, um, and so we want to talk about ways to help you through that. Um, your pain can either be from a mechanical injury like surgery. It can be from a burn which I'm sure we've all experienced, whether it's a sunburn or, or you burn yourself um, on the iron or something, or a chemical burn. Um, they all, all of these kinds of pain are going to cause tissue damage and your body responds to that. Um, there's three types of uh, pathophysiology that, uh, that can result in chronic pain. Uh, there's nociceptive pain, which is like rheumatoid arthritis, um, gout, osteoarthritis. There is neuropathic pain, which is actually just nerve pain. Um, and uh, you get that peripheral neuropathy um, if you have diabetes for a long period of time, and that is generated from the nerves itself. Then you've got your sensory hypersensitivity like fibromyalgia where everything is just lit up and it's difficult to calm all that down and you just kind of hurt everywhere. And you can have all three of these kinds of pain um, in one person and that's a, that's a real challenge. Um, so with nociceptive pain, you have some kind of an injury and you have um, all these nerve endings out in that tissue and different parts of your body, you're gonna have more nerve endings than in others. Your fingertips are very full of nerve endings. Um, so when you have surgery, the skin is interrupted, the, the nerve endings are uh, damaged, and your body's sending all these, um, sending circulation that's full of things to try and combat and help it heal. Um, one of the big things is something called prostaglandins, which are chemicals that your body sends to to inflame everything and, and it causes fever and it causes pain and, and uh, it sends your whole coagulation cascade and supports all your platelets in order to help you clot if there's bleeding. So your body has all these things that happen when there is an injury and then the, those nerve endings are connected to uh, uh, a nociceptor and then that comes into the spine, which is your big nerve, up the back. And that's what happens when you have an injury type. Then there's the neuropathic pain, that neuropathic pain. And as you can see, you have these cushions between your discs. And that's to help that spine as you move and cushion it. What happens is if you get pain um, on one of these nerve roots or one of the nerves that's running out to another part of the body, it can affect a whole segment um, of your uh, system. For example, if you have, a, 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 say you have a bulging disc at L5, it's gonna not only affect here, you're gonna feel it more down your leg and around to the front all the way down to the side, okay? When I had a disc at, L4, at L5S1, uh, I felt that pain not in my back at all. I felt it in my hip, down the side, 
and it felt like the, the most of my pain was in my ankles. And so that's, you have what are called dermatomes, which are matched up to each of those um, uh, spinal nerves. Okay? And that's why people can develop pain in their feet and their toes, and it's not related to that. The actual injury or the, the place that it's coming from is actually up in the spine. Okay? Um, and then with fibromyalgia, it's like all your nerves are on fire, and it just hurts everywhere. And the goal is to calm all of that down so that you can then um, um, have some sort of quality of life. And that's all inflamed. It's really, really difficult to, to move. So your typical treatments for pain are going to be analgesics, which are um, things like um, Tylenol or your opioid medications that you're all familiar with. Steroids, which are real powerful anti-inflammatory medications. Your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which are less strong but are still anti-inflammatories. Cold and heat play a huge role in pain control. And physical therapy, which helps you to repair that damage that may have occurred. So the way non-steroidal anti-inflammatories work and the reason that we don't want you taking them is because of those prostaglandins. Like I said, they're chemicals that your body produces when there's an injury. And they cause the pain, they cause inflammation, they support your platelets, they cause fever, and they protect the lining of your stomach, okay? When you take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, you lose um, all of this. It's no longer um, helping you to clot, so it actually promotes bleeding and it causes ulcers in the stomach because now you don't have those prostaglandins protecting the lining of the stomach anymore. Okay? That's why they're so dangerous. Now, in our patients, a lot of patients prior to surgery take them on a daily basis. And our goal is hopefully as you go through surgery and lose some of that um, that weight that you take the pressure off of those joints and maybe you won't need so many. Um, is there anybody in here who takes them on a daily basis, that takes um, um, any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory on a daily basis? You used to. How many of you used to take a lot of NSAIDs? Good. And the surgery has helped you to get off of those? You still have pain, okay. Well, that's why we're here today. It's like, what can you do about that? Um, so there are a lot of what we call complementary and alternative therapies um, outside of uh, some of the medications. And these are the things that are not normally generally accepted in the wonderful world of medicine. We have a tendency to turn our nose up at anything that doesn't come from science. Um, and there isn't a lot of science uh, and a lot of research behind some of these. There's a lot of anecdotal information that comes uh, through uh, uh, working with patients who may have uh, used these. Um, and a lot of the studies are, oh, fine, that really cramps up the. <laughs> um, a lot of the studies were done on people with arthritis, fibromyalgia, low back pain, a lot of the things that we see as chronic pain. And um, they rated these different therapies, uh, one to five, five being the most effective, based on what they, what they were told by the, the people that they were working with. And the ones that were most highly rated were acupuncture, um, and massage. Those were the two uh, most effective, um, and acupuncture is becoming more and more accepted, and you're starting to see acupuncture therapists actually working in hospital settings uh, to a certain degree. Uh, the, the big challenge for people right now is to find someone that they trust, that they know is, is highly skilled at this, because it is something that takes a really uh, skilled practitioner that's really studied the Chinese medicine. I've had acupuncture by people who know what they were doing, and then I've had acupuncture by people that were highly trained. 
Uh, for my personal um, uh, experience, I didn't find it that helpful for me, but I know a lot of people who have. And so um, you want to just, you, you want to approach a practitioner with some research. You want to understand how long they've been doing it, how did they study, you know, what their, um, what their experience is. Um, massage is wonderful for uh, fibromyalgia and for low back pain for the pain that comes from your muscles. It's not going to do anything for neuropathic pain really, but so often pain causes you to tighten your muscles. And the result is that you need, uh, the massage helps you to relax those muscles and that helps to decrease the pain. I, um, I have a friend who had um, a bariatric surgery about five years ago who does massage for um, uh, fibromyalgia very effectively. And uh, that can be very, very helpful. For low back pain, depends on what the, what's causing the back pain. Is it muscle or is it, uh, you know, from a, if it's from a bulging disc, massage is probably not gonna do a whole lot for it. Um, the things that they rated as a four were Tai Chi, uh, which is very good for osteoarthritis and degenerative joint disease because it gets you moving and it's so um, gentle on the joints to do it, but it does uh, get you moving uh, and, and move, movement and activity is very helpful when you have osteoarthritis. Yoga is also very effective for back pain. Um, when I was going through my back surgeries, I did a program called Yoganetics. Uh, with Wyatt Townley, um, who developed Yoganetics, which is a combination of yoga and movement. So you're not just going into a position, but you're going into a position, and then you're doing some strength training with it. And um, that was, that kept me pain-free for a very long time. Um, yoga really stretches you out, and it stretches not just your muscles, it stretches your nerves along with it, and that can be really, really helpful. I forgot to, I, I meant to add to here, chiropractic. That's one you hear a lot about, you know, a lot of people that go to chiropractors. Um, again, that's one of those things you really need to look at the individual practitioner. You want to get a personal recommendation from somebody who knows them. Um, and uh, they can be very effective for certain kinds of pain. Uh, not all, but uh, they, I, I would rate them as a five um, for a lot of things. My husband has a chiropractor that he goes to and it really works very effectively for him. He's also having a hip replaced next month, so we're gonna get to the root of the problem. <laughs> um, relaxation therapy is very promising. Um, we actually have a relaxation CD that we used years ago. Uh, we would give it to people prior to surgery um, a lot of people simply didn't use it, so we stopped um, buying them, but uh, I do still have some of those relaxation CDs that really help, they walk you through a total body relaxation as you're relaxing each body uh, uh, part, and that is very helpful for uh, cutting down on pain. Um, the other things that didn't rate as effectively, but that people spend an awful lot of money on, <laughs> are aromatherapy, um, meditation um, is great for relaxation. I don't know that it's particularly effective for, um, for pain relief. Biofeedback has been used for years. And I, again, I don't know how effective it is at decreasing pain. Um, I think what biofeedback does best is address the emotional component um, or, or the um, anxiety that comes with it. Um, you've read about copper bracelets and magnets. They're everywhere. Um, there is absolutely no science behind that at all. Um, hypnotherapy or imagery in the right setting for the right reason can be, but I, I've never seen it be particularly effective for pain. Um, I've seen it work for quitting smoking. Um, I've seen it work for patients who were, that had cancer and needed to really uh, boost their immune system. 
I've seen it work where it actually helped in that regard. But as far as pain, uh, I haven't seen a whole lot. Imagery goes along with that. Uh, Qigong is a uh, martial art training that is wonderful. Um, and I've seen it be very helpful for people that have other conditions. Um, I, I actually know a guy who had horrible COPD that improved dramatically doing some Qigong, so I, I hesitate to write it off, but I don't know how much of that came from the practice of Qigong and how much of it came from um, just the workout that he was doing uh, along with it. And then reflexology is where um, it's an Eastern uh, form of uh, medicine where they believe all of your nerves have uh, a place on the bo uh, bottom of your foot and by massaging those different or um, pressure, putting pressure on those different points, um, you can relieve the, um, the, the nerve pain uh, that, goes, that follows that nerve pathway up. And the recommendation in the literature is, you know, what works for one person may not work for somebody else. And what doesn't work for one person may work very well for someone else. A lot of it is trusting it and a lot of, uh, a lot of it is, uh, to a certain extent, the placebo effect. Um, and, uh, but the important thing is, they said, you know, it's not something you want to waste a lot of time and money on if it's not working for you after a couple of times. So anything is, is an option but you don't want to uh, stick with something that's not helping you. Now, uh, as far as other supplementation, um, the most frequently used pain control in Europe is something called ASU. Um, there, which stands for avocado soybean unsaponifiable. I don't know what that word means. But um, it is used extensively in, Euro in Europe, and it is said to almost eliminate their use of NSAIDs over there. Um, it's supposed to be as effective as that. You take a couple of them a day. It is natural, and you can buy them on Amazon. Now, I don't know how, how you grade those because we don't, they're not, they're not regulated by the FDA in this country, but I do know that that's what they use in Europe, that you see almost no opioid use over there, and you see a very limited use of your non-steroidals because they go to more natural types of, of uh, uh, pain relief. So I, I, someday I'm going to buy some of those and give them a, tr give them a try and see how they work. I, and I'm not recommending any of these things, I'm just saying this is what the research shows. And that was the most commonly used uh, medication. Um, glucosamine and chondroitin, those are going to, they're going to slow the progression of osteoarthritis. They're going to decrease the inflammation. They're going to improve your joint function. And the research showed they were as effective as taking Celebrex. And Celebrex is a very powerful COX-2 inhibitor. So, you know, um, my husband takes glucosamine um, every day, and it's what's kept my little old dog running. He takes glucosamine too, and um, I, I highly recommend glucosamine and chondroitin. It's, you want to always check with the doctor before you start any supplement, but um, I think pretty um, across the board, you'll see a lot of people use them very effectively. Uh, fish oil is an omega-3 fatty acid which blocks those inflammatory uh, chemicals or cytokines. And I've even seen rheumatoid arth uh, uh, rheumatologists who work with patients with rheumatoid arthritis uh, prescribe something called Omax-3, which you can buy online. It's a powerful um, uh, fish oil, very pure fish oil supplement. And um, I, I know people with rheumatoid arthritis that take it on a daily basis and find it very, very effective. Uh, flax seed, which is also, um, it's high in linoleic acid and it's a type of omega-3. You do want to be a little cautious with some of these because they can act as blood thinners. 
if you're already on a blood thinner, you want to really check before you would start any of those because they could um, increase that, that effect. Interestingly, ginger, the spice ginger, is, um, is a COX-2 inhibitor. And, and you're, I'm not going to go into what COX-2 inhibitors are, but they're part of that whole inflammatory uh, uh, response. And they say that ginger is an, a really good one. Uh, two grams a day, I don't know that you could eat that much, but um, ginger capsules or ginger tea or adding it into your diet certainly is, is gonna be helpful. Um, also, in Indian frankincense. Um, the only time I've ever seen frankincense was I read about it in the Bible when the wise men gave it uh, to the new baby. Um, but they do say that it slows cartilage damage and it has strong anti-inflammatory and analgesic effects. And that's probably why it was so valuable back in those days. Um, and they recommend three to 400 milligrams a day. I don't know where you buy it, but I'm guessing if you go to the internet, you can find anything. Um, and then um, Sami or Sami, however you say it, um, is also an effective anti-inflammatory and analgesic that works with B vitamins. And it is again said to work as effective as Celebrex, but it needs to be monitored by your primary care provider. But I do know um, that um, it, it's one of those things you can buy at health food stores over the counter. And uh, I don't know anybody who's been on it, but I do know that um, we had patients when I worked in the pain clinic we had patients that would take that and, and found it not only helped uh, with the pain, but it would have a little bit of an antidepressant effect as well. Um, and then we come to CBD oil, which is the big new thing that's everywhere. You can't go anywhere without seeing CBD oil. Um, cannabidiol is, or I don't know how you say that, but uh, cannabidol, I don't know, anyway. Um, it comes from industrial hemp, and it is the major constituent of cannabis, but what makes people high from smoking cannabis is your THC. Now, CBD oil is supposed to contain less than three-tenths of a percent of THC, so you have no effect of feeling um, um, high. <laughs> You're just supposed to get the effect from the uh, um, from uh, the the oil. The only FDA approved CBD oil, CBD oil out there is something called Epidiolex, which is approved for use in seizure disorder seizure disorders, and it's not approved for anything else. But that is the only pure source that um, that there is out there because 70% of the products sold online that they tested did not contain the concentration of the oil listed on the label, okay? There was way less of the, t of the, um, uh, the oil or the uh, CBD oil and a lot of them had a significant amount of THC in them um, and just a word, it cannot prevent cure or treat cancer, okay? That's one of the claims that's out there. Don't believe it. So I had my husband try some CBD oil because I thought, oh, well, this is good because he lives on um, um, Indocin and a lot of uh, uh, NSAIDs at the moment. And um, he took it uh, for a couple of weeks and he said, yeah, it really did make a difference, but I noticed a change in his affect. And he said, yeah, I've just been so depressed lately. And I said, really? I said, did that start when you started the CBD oil? He goes, oh, maybe it did. So he stopped the CBD oil and his mood went back to being normal. So a word of caution, <laughs> the side effects may be worse than um, the pain relief that you get. Now, I know lots and lots of people that use CBD oil very effectively for pain. I also know people that smoke a joint for pain relief, and I'm not promoting either of those. <laughs> I am simply saying that's my personal experience um, with it, and 
Um, so if you want to try some, make sure you get it from someplace reputable. I know the pharmacy right next door sells um, a, a pretty uh, pure source of it. Um, I don't know what the studies are behind it. I'm sure over the next uh, few years, we're gonna see a lot of research done about it. Um, I do know it works very effectively for children who have seizures, um, that it can uh, slow or stop um, those seizures. Beyond that, um, all I know is anecdotal. There just isn't a whole lot of research out there. A lot of patients ask about CBD oil in class, um, or if they can smoke a joint for pain relief. I can't tell people yes or no. Um, it, is, it is legal now for, for uh, medical reasons, so pain relief would fall under that. But um, just approach that with some caution. And smoking is always discouraged after bariatric surgery because it's always going to increase the amount of gastric acids that you your stomach produces, which is always a risk for ulcers. Um, as far as your topicals, um, your probably the best one is Voltaren gel, and it's um, something that you have to have a prescription for, but um, you take it um, a couple of times a day on, and put it on the affected joint, and um, that can take a, a while to see the results of that. It's not one of those things that you're gonna have instant pain relief from. Um, but it is uh, probably that one of the best anti-inflammatory gels out, out, out there. There's also capsaicin, which is made from um, a hot pepper called cap capsicum, and it provides warmth to that area. And um, people who use it on a regular basis, two or three times a day, do say that it has it caused there's uh, about a 50% reduction in pain. It's not going to get rid of it entirely, but it will help with that pain. Um, always wash your hands after using it, or your hands will start to burn. <laughs> so, because uh, it is it is uh, does cause a very warming uh, effect. Then you've got your salicylates, which are made from asper uh, aspirin. So you've got aspirin cream and Bengay, and those are all aspirin-based creams. And aspirin is a very effective um, pain reliever. Um, unfortunately, it's also an NSAID. So, uh, but you can use the, the creams. Uh, and now there is uh, lidoderm patches, which uh, again are prescription, and you can apply to the um, affected area, and what it's basically doing is numbing it up like an injection of lidocaine would do. Um, so they're good for temporary relief, not good for um, uh, long term. Yes? Um, okay, but you're using the NSAID gel, so mm -hmm. they're going to take percent of the patient? Not, they're not going to be nearly as strong. Oh. Yeah. Um, they're going to, they're not going to work as well as taking medication internally but they do provide, your body does absorb them, and because it isn't going quite as systemically as when you take a pill, it's gonna be inclined to stay more in that area. So um, it's a little safer to use those things uh, topically. And never underestimate heat and cold. Um, ice, right after an injury, is what we always do. Um, when somebody injures themselves, uh, hurts their ankles, or sprains something, you want to put ice on it because it helps to reduce the circulation to that area and reduce that whole inflammatory response. And then, after 48 hours, ice isn't going to do you any good. Then you want to move to heat, and you want to um, use that to help reabsorb all those, all that inflammation and all that fluid that's gone to that area. For chronic pain. Alternating ice and heat, like uh, 20 minutes of heat, and then a couple hours later, 20 minutes of ice, that can be very soothing, particularly for nerve pain. Um, that can be very, very helpful. So, um, that one of the biggest things I think that people can do to help uh, chronic inflammation is look at their diet. There are a lot of foods that you eat that cause increased inflammation, and the number one cause of inflammation in the body is sugar. 
Um, so you need to get as much of that out of your body as you can. Um, your saturated and trans fats also can cause um, uh, some inflammation. Your omega-6s, your body, what we need is omega-3s, and so much of what our food contains is, uh, are, are the omega-6s, like corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower, grapeseed, soy, and peanut oil. You, it's okay to have some of that, but you don't want to use only that. You want to use uh, things that have more of the omega-3s because your body needs to see uh, a better ratio, and if Laura was here, she could tell you what that ratio is, but our foods have gotten laden with an awful lot more of the omega-6s and a lot less of the omega-3s, so you need to increase the omega-3s in your diet. Your refined carbohydrates like donuts, white bread, white rice, right, uh, and white pasta, those things are all going to increase inflammation because they cause your blood sugar to spike real high. Um, and they happen, and that happens really quickly, and then when your blood sugar spikes, it causes insulin to be dumped into your body, and um, that's all going to cause increase in your inflammation. Um, aspartame, which is one of those um, sugar substitutes, is also very toxic and you want to avoid that. Um, alcohol has a lot of sugar in it, so you want to go uh, a little careful with that. And nightshade vegetables, things like tomatoes and eggplant, um, that group of, of uh, uh, vegetables can cause increased inflammation. And I don't even know how that happens, but I do know that nightshade vegetables are considered to be very inflammatory. Um, the best diet you can use is more of a Mediterranean diet, where you're eating a lot more fish, particularly your fatty uh, fish, sardines, mackerel, salmon, uh, vegetables, especially broccoli, sweet potatoes, onion, kale, peas, those kinds of vegetables. Um, using your olive oil. Um, the Mediterranean diet uses safflower oil, which the other one says not to use too much, but um, uh, if you can stick with olive oil, it's not like you can't use any of those other things. It's not like you can't ever have them. It's just that you don't want to have your diet, uh, you don't want to be consuming a lot of those. And then walnuts are the best nut um, that you can eat um, because they have a, a lot more of your omega-3s and uh, your fatty acids. And green tea is a wonderful anti-inflammatory. Um, so if you like tea, try incorporating some green tea into your diet. Not only does it, yes? Is green tea caffeinated though? Yes? A lot of their cravings. So uh, if you're if you're struggling with feeling hungry a lot, try sipping on a lot of green tea, and you may find that it'll help to uh, cut down on that. But basically, yeah, I get that NSAIDs are the best thing, and if you have to take NSAIDs, I understand that. You want to make sure that a the, the surgeon is aware that you're taking them. They may want to put you on something to help protect your stomach because you have to take them, and you never, ever want to take them on an empty stomach. Please take them on a full stomach because they do need to protect the lining of that stomach from the impact of that. If you take an occasional Advil for a headache, you know, maybe once or twice a month, it's fine. Just make sure that you're eating it, you're taking it on a, a full stomach. But if you need something on a daily basis, um, consider something that isn't um, going to be as hard on that stomach. That you always have to protect that little stomach. And um, I, I don't take NSAIDs at all because I've had ulcers since I was nine years old. So I have a very weak stomach and I don't ever take any Advil, any Aleve, anything like that because it just tears me up. I can't, it just hurts. So um, do 
protect your stomach from those those non steroidal. Yes. and your prilosec and your nexium and those kinds. Um, they work differently than your histamine blockers like Zantac and Tavimet, those kinds. Um, they, one cuts down on the acid your stomach is producing, one blocks the effect of the histamine in your body which um, um, can cause extra, extra acid. So, you know, personally, I take the histamine blockers. I take uh, Tagumet or Zantac uh, myself if, I, if I'm ever gonna take something like that. Um, but um, again, that's something you probably, I know the docs uh, like the uh, proton pump inhibitors like the Metrazol uh, better. But there's other ways of protecting your stomach. There's uh, things that will coat your stomach. Um, back in the day when I was young, everybody took Maalox or, or one of those, one of those um, kinds of things that coated your stomach and, and made it feel better. Um, you don't see those used as much because they can uh, cause, block a lot of absorption, but um, there's a lot of things that can protect your stomach. Even something as simple as eating some crackers and drinking some milk and then taking your, your medication is very helpful. Alrighty, any other questions? Any comments, any experiences with anything like uh, we've talked about? 